Hello and welcome to briefing number 13 in the Marketing for Charity series brought to you by the Worshipful Company of Marketors. In this briefing we're going to cover the area of action planning, project management and project control. My name is Peter Rees and it's my pleasure once again to be your host and narrator for this session. As usual, I'll start by giving you an overview of the items we're going to cover in this briefing. I'll start by giving you a quick checkpoint and reminder of where this step fits into the overall SOSTAC process that we've been following. I'll then talk about some ideas behind the concept of action planning and give you some good ideas about best and in fact worst practice. I'll then go on to the main section in this briefing which is all about project management which is controlling the tasks, the timing and the resources as you execute different projects within your charity organisation. I'll follow up by just showing you the next step in this overall briefing series and then as usual explain how any questions will be handled and finish with some concluding remarks. Here I'm going to position this briefing in terms of the overall series and where we've got to. So this is the fifth step of the SOSTAC model after situation, setting objectives, working out the strategy on how we'll deliver them, getting the detailed tactics which will deliver these, we get on to this stage which is action and action planning and project management and this really answers the question who does what and when. Let me start by looking at the general concept of action planning to answer the question who does what and when and look at the variables which we have under our control. To begin with I'll look at the four main areas in project management and the things that we need to consider and control to execute our projects on time and within budget. And there are four areas shown on this diagram here. The first is the tasks, the individual activities that need to be completed uh, which make up the totality of the project. So a task list is the first thing that you'll see in most project management systems. The second thing is the timetable or the calendar or the timeline over which these tasks are spread. And you can set up different timelines for different parts of the project and different timetables and, ca and um, calendars for the different people involved, as, as I'll explain later on. In more sophisticated systems, you can put in a third variable, which is the relationship between tasks. So, for example, we might have a situation that task four cannot start until task three has finished, which allows us to look at connect resources and connect tasks together and get an idea of the critical path and the fastest way through the project and the dependencies that make that up. The fourth area is resources, which is a way of measuring and controlling and understanding and planning for the four areas that make up resources in most projects, which are the people, the time, the raw materials, and any facilities, machines, buildings, software or systems that you need to put in place to get the job done. So these are the four areas that make up most projects, and it's all about how well we manage and control these. Many projects, in my experience, fail to achieve their potential and sometimes they go over time or over budget, sometimes they flounder, drift or fail completely and there's a number of common reasons for this and if you look at the news you'll see this is quite often the case in some public sector contracts and public sector projects with which we'll all be familiar. And these are the main reasons. So let's go through these blue um, diagrams one at a time. The first one is because there is no coherent plan. Nobody has taken a holistic view or actually set a realistic and achievable deadline and end point by which the project should be completed. It's just done on a best efforts basis and a sort of um, laissez-faire attitude and then projects drift and extend and the budget goes over what is planned. So that's the first reason. The second one, and this is very common in some of the businesses I've worked for over the last 40 years, is what I call meeting mania. Somebody senior will call a meeting to discuss topic X. There's no clear agenda item, there's no ownership, there's no clear purpose, and it's just meeting up for a nice chat. Now, the worst example of this, or the most striking example of this, was an organisation I worked for some years ago, which used to have a quarterly meeting with managers from all the different countries around the world. And we'd hold these in a very nice location in a European capital, and we'd fly in about 20 different country managers and meet with the board of directors and the management team from head office. And we'd sit down for two days and chat about things and discuss options and possibilities and share nice ideas. Nothing was written down and everybody would leave the meeting with no plan of action, no ownership for the tasks that were due to be completed, no timetable. And we'd drift away and come back in 
three months time and have another meeting perhaps in another European city and actually worked out if one added together the cost of the hotel accommodation the time and the salary of all these very senior people from around the world their airfares and hotel bills and meals it we were running meetings that cost about 20,000 euros a day to run if you added together all the costs of the people involved so a two-day meeting would be 40,000 euros with no outcome no ownership and no clear agenda or plan there are often unclear aims within a charity, so uh, this is particularly the case, uh, unfortunately, with charity organisations who perhaps have less experience in this area. They've put together a programme and they might decide that they're going to um, increase their visibility or improve their website, which are good sort of general aims, but there's no clear purpose, there's no clear objectives, there's no smart measurable objectives to measure the success of the project and often no follow-up from the different parts of the project to see if it's worked together and it's actually delivered the objectives and achieved the aims. So these are just general observations about reasons why projects and the meetings that make them up sometimes fail, flounder and deliver a project late or over the planned budget. Now in order to address these areas we need to look at a topic called project management which is how you control projects and the tasks that make them up in an efficient and effective manner. And what I'm going to go through in the next section is project management in theory and then give you some practical advice on how to do it successfully. I'll start off by showing you a simple technique to manage a project very cost effectively and if you think back to the four blue blocks that I showed you in the earlier diagram and remember, remember projects consist of four parts there's the tasks the timetable or the calendar the independencies between the tasks and the resources that one needs and using a simple tool and basically it's Excel spreadsheet you can address three of these areas so here is an example using a, a modified project that I'm actually using at the minute working with one of my consulting clients and you can see here the left hand column gives a list of the activities so we have an executive briefing a half day segmentation targeting positioning introduction and workshop and so on down um, column a you can see the tasks that make up this project column b shows you the resources and in this case i'm just showing the people involved it's the top managers for task two and the managers and full-time staff and so on so column B shows the resources now you could add in extra columns next to column B you could put in um, a budgetary column for how much money each activity is going to take you could put another column in from external resources and any resources or materials that you're going to bring in from outside the organization then at the minute on this diagram column C through to N show the activities that are going to happen week on week and as you can see here this is a 12-week project so in week one the first three things are going to happen. There's going to be an executive briefing, a half day workshop on segmentation targeting positioning and then a workshop where the campaign planning team are going to get down and do the detail. Some tasks as you can see last just a week and some tasks like task in line six, the segmentation research is an activity going to be undertaken by the research team that takes three weeks. You can see it's going to happen over weeks two, three and four in this diagram. So straight away using an Excel spreadsheet you can set up a very simple task list like this to help you control your project you can add in as I say columns for extra resources as required the only thing that it doesn't allow you to do is identify interdependencies between the different tasks and I'll show you a more sophisticated uh, method in a following slide which shows you how you can address that shortfall but I would just recommend this to your uh, attention if you're a smaller charity or on a limited budget you could certainly get started using a simple project plan like this which you can build in Microsoft Excel which most organizations have or can get fairly cheaply I'll now describe a more sophisticated approach which is the fact the one that I use that allows you to manage projects of all sizes and it's called Microsoft project it's part of the Microsoft software suite for office so this Microsoft PowerPoint Word Excel and also Microsoft Project. It's a very sophisticated system but I use it even for small projects um, up to the more complex ones. It's very functional. Let me describe how it works and what it does and then I'll give you some examples and screenshots of Microsoft Project in action. 
As we know, project plans are built first of all on a list of tasks or activities that need to be completed. And each task requires three pieces of information essentially, a start date, an end date, and a duration. And in Microsoft Project, if you enter any two of those pieces of data, it will calculate the third. So if you put in the start and end date, it will calculate the duration. You put in the start date and the duration, and it will calculate the end date. So it just does that piece of work for you and saves you some time right from the outset. The next thing you can do is you can define dependencies, which tasks have to be completed before a follow-on task was uh, uh, could start. So for example, if you're building a house, let's say very simply you're building a house, there's three stages. You build the foundations, you build the walls, and then you put the roof on. And you can't start the walls until you finish the foundations, and you can't start the roof until you finish the walls. So there's straightaway dependencies from foundations to walls to roof. So you would connect those together in your project, and what that means is any slippage in an earlier task will have a knock-on effect later on. So if you'd plan to install the foundations in one month, and in fact it took you two months, because everything else depends on it, the whole project will have slipped by that extra month. So putting in dependencies allow you, if an early task in the dependent chain extends as you start work on the project, the Microsoft Project will automatically calculate the effect of everything that comes later that depends on that task that has slipped or the duration has extended. The system also allows you to prioritize and plot the tasks and their dependencies. So as you'll see on a previous, uh, on a subsequent slide in a few minutes, I'll show you something called a Gantt chart, which shows how all these things connect and you'll be able to see the impact and the fact that Microsoft Project automatically alters the duration and the um, extent of dependent tasks. The next area that it identifies is the critical path and the critical path identifies the way through a complex project with the dependent tasks that shows you the earliest start date and the earliest finish date. And in fact if you look at the critical path of a project it is the time that the project is going to take in total. So you could have a project with 20 or 30 or 40 different activities and by identifying the critical path you can identify which of those tasks will have an impact on the final date if they extend or if the date slips. So it shows you the critical things, the critical tasks within a project which will have an impact on the final due date of the project overall. It's called the critical path. And then finally it will also plot task completion information that can be updated as the project progresses. So as you go through things in real time, you can update start dates or end dates. You can extend the duration of tasks if they took longer than you expected. You can shorten tasks if they took less time than you had planned. And the whole way you're getting a, a up, real time updated view of the project as a whole, and you can track what impact it's having on the overall project end date. Now there's quite a lot to consider though, so perhaps it's easier if I showed you the next slide, which is a diagram which shows you how these things are presented in Microsoft Project. So here's a screenshot of a project laid out in Microsoft Project, and you can see it's pretty similar to um, the example I gave you in Excel. If you look here, you've got a list of tasks, which are the things in about the third column from the left, the words that told you all the things that are going to happen. And then to the right of that, you can see how long a project, how long an activity is going to take. So there's a number of days for each task, and then a start date and an end date. So those could have been compiled either by putting in any two out of those three variables. You put in two pieces of information about start date, end date, and duration, and it will calculate the third for you. As you go through the project, you can adjust any of these variables and you can either show that uh, something didn't start when planned or didn't finish when planned or took longer than expected and Microsoft will do the necessary calculations and adjust the detail accordingly. So this is a very quick and easy way to set up. It really is extremely fast to set up a project and as you can see here it's got subheadings like initiate, plan, analyze and design which is the way in which you split projects into its component parts. The main way that information is presented in a project management system, including Microsoft Project, is a diagram called a Gantt chart. And this is named after an American naval engineer who invented the concept after the Second World War. And that gentleman's name was Elmer Gantt. So here you can see what a Gantt chart looks like. 
If you look to the left of it, you'll see a list of all the activities that are due in this project. And where there's a little outline of a head next to it, it means that those particular activities have some resources assigned to them. Some people are involved in those individual activities. Moving to the right a little bit, you can see two columns which identify the start and the end date of the project, which are filled in across to the right uh, based on the calendar that you've set up. And there's another column there with a percentage shown. In fact, they're all shown as 0% at the minute. But as you go through a project, you can identify the percentage completion of individual tasks. So if a task was 50% complete, you'd fill in a 50% in this column for that activity, and it would colour in that task's box on the Gantt chart a different colour to show that it's completed. Now, if you look to the right on the main part of the Gantt chart, you'll see that there are some tasks, like the top three, where you've got big red boxes, design, subscription model, and application program interface, or API. These are just tasks that happen in the dates and for the duration shown. Underneath those, you've got a number of red boxes, and then, in fact, a blue box at the end, which are dependent one upon the other. So later tasks cannot start until an earlier task is completed. So you can see here with this little animation, if you drag the top red box with the arrow coming out of it to the right, one called blog post, it, it identifies the fact that it's going to start at a later date. You've just dragged it to show it's starting at a later date. And as a result, all of the dependent tasks after it also move forward in time, keeping their relative position. And in this way, you can model the impact on your project of slipping start dates, of making dur activities have a shorter or longer duration, or changing the start date or end date of any one of them. And that then is a summary of a Gantt chart. The next area I want to touch on is the area of resource management. If you remember, this was one of the four quadrants in the blue box diagram I showed you earlier in this briefing. And resources is all about managing and controlling a number of things. So excuse me for the slightly sexist um, alliteration here, but resources are usually categorised as men, money, machines, materials and minutes. So it's human resources, people, it's the money, the budget you're spending. It's any machines, which if you're doing a building project could be a digger or a crane, but in business terms it could be a computer, it could be a fax machine, or it could be some software. Materials are raw materials if you're producing something um, that you're providing to your beneficiaries, and minutes is the time. And these are the areas of resource that people manage with a project management tool, such as Microsoft Project. You can allocate resources to each individual task. So for task three in your project, you can say how many man hours or person hours are allocated, what uh, equipment is needed, what raw materials, and of course on the project diagram, you show how long it's going to take. You can also allocate money, as I said, and you can do that on the basis of a fixed cost per hour. So for example, you're using a contract programmer or a web designer, they may charge their time to you at so much per hour. Or you could have a contractor who's working with you at a fixed cost, in which case that fixed cost will just be allocated to the project no matter how long it is. It's not time dependent. Resources can be named. So a particular task within your project, a particular activity can have an individual named person associated with it. It could be a project leader, a designer, a programmer, a web designer, a marketing person. So individual people can be allocated to either an individual task or a total category. So for example, if you're doing some web design, you can allocate one person to be the supervisor for the whole project. And then within that, you can have individual tasks, which you can allocate to individual technical people who might be doing some sort of update to your website, for example. Resources availability can also be managed with an, a, a calendar associated for each person. So if, for example, you are using a contract fundraiser, they may only be able to work for you three days a week, let's say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So on their calendar, you'd set it up to say that they could only work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday each week, and it would take account of that when it's scheduling their time across the project. Eventually, effectively, they're only working a three-day week in this example. Resources are allocated simply by adding in new columns and new information to the overall project definition which you have in Microsoft Project. So here is the same project as I've shown you before, but now inside this red box you can see I've identified some individual people 
to be responsible for different tasks within this overall project. And again, you can add in other columns to talk about their availability, limitations on their calendar, and in fact, their budget, if they're either charged as a fixed cost or at an hourly rate. That can all be added in. And then when you do the calculations, when you get Microsoft Project to do its work, it will produce tables and reports, which I'll show you on the following slide. On this slide, there's a summary of just one of the resource reports, which you can see here, and a list I'll show you now of all the sorts of information that you can extract or get Microsoft Project to manage and report to you. You can get a report on the total resources used by the project, and that can be all of the people, the hours, the money, and so on. You can allocate budgets against each task or against each section of the project and compare what you're actually spending to your budget, and that way see if you're over or under spending on any particular part of the project. You can look at the resources you're using by period, so how many hours of programmers, how many hours of developers, how many hours of fundraisers, how many hours of volunteer are you using week by week or day by day or month by month. You can look at a resource shortfall. So if, for example, you've decided when you're setting this up that a particular task in your project needed, say, five person days per week, but you only have three person days available, that will highlight that as resource shortfall. You can then take the decision whether to hire in more resources and increase the cost or extend the time for that activity to just make use of the limited resources you have, which means that overall they're going to take longer to complete that activity. Again, you can look at resource shortfalls if there's a gap, and you can look at resource underutilization. You may, for example, have a group of people, let's say there's in total 100 person hours a week available, and you can see if only 50 person hours are being used up. Therefore, that means that some of the people have up to 50% of their time free, which you can reallocate to other activities. You can look on the impact of hiring in resources. If you want to hire people in from outside to get more resources, how much would it cost? How much would it affect the duration of activities and, in fact, the final end date of the project as a whole? And you can look at resource availability. How many people will I have, let's say, in the summer holiday? Or how many people will I have in the next month? And it can just really report all the resources in almost any combination and... Uh, variability that you wish to have. So it's extremely flexible, the reporting system, and it gives you a huge amount of information to allow you to manage your resources and take account of availability and, and utilization so you can make decisions whether to buy more people in or to take longer to do the project activities with resources that you have available. A really flexible and really excellent management system. So now that we've covered some ideas about managing meetings and managing projects overall, here's a couple of actions that I suggest you think about for your own organisation and the next project that you wish to use and manage closely. So for meetings, set a clear purpose for all meetings, issue the agenda in advance and send out the minutes very soon afterwards. When I was working in Paris, the um, European director that I worked for in Paris had a rule that after every meeting, the minutes of that meeting would be sent out that evening. So people had to work, stay behind after the meeting finished and spend an hour or two completing the minutes so that a day never went by without the minutes for a meeting that day being issued to all the attendees and other interested parties. Set clear re responsibilities and a due date to allow for any follow-up actions. So in the case of the example I've given you in Paris, at the start of the next meeting, we'd review the minutes of the previous meeting, the action plan that had been agreed, and people in the room had to report before the new meeting started what they've achieved and how well they did with the follow-up actions that were allocated to them at the previous meeting. During a project or during meetings generally, set project milestones and checkpoints and report progress to all interested parties. It's very important that you communicate the, the progress that you're making with the different projects that you're undertaking to highlight to management in advance of any possible problems or the need to spend more money and any impacts that actions, activities are having on the due date for the project's completion. When you are managing a project, I've given you two examples. If you want to use a simple, straightforward, easy to set up, very quick to use uh, management reporting tool, use Microsoft Excel in the first example that I showed you with the purple diagrams. If you want to be slightly more sophisticated or if you have more complex projects with a lot of resources, a lot of tasks and a lot of budget implications, then I recommend that you look at um, something like Microsoft Project. Now that's just my uh, preferred tool, but 
There are others available. If you do a search on the internet for project management system, you'll find a wide range of suppliers for project management software. Some are chargeable and some actually are free. So just choose which one you think suits you better. But look out and make sure that they cover all of the main things. The tasks, the calendar, the dependencies and the resources. And if you follow one of these approaches, I think you'll do, uh, you should be able to do a good job in managing your projects for the future. Well, that brings me to the end of this briefing and I hope you've enjoyed it. So let's look at the next step in the program. As you may remember, we're now going through and we're towards the end of the SOSTAC business model and framework. And we've just completed the action stage with answering the question, who does what when? In the next stage, we're going to look at metrics and analytics systems, which answer the question, how do we ensure safe arrival? So I look forward to joining you for that next briefing shortly. I'll just remind you that if you do have any questions or comments or feedback on this briefing, please get in touch and you can contact me at this email address, peter.rees at gmail.com. I'd be very pleased to hear from you and I'll do my best to answer any questions that you may send to me. I'll finish off as usual with a concluding quotation, which comes from uh, Thomas Jefferson, who said, I find that the harder I work, the more luck I seem to have. And using tools such as I've shown you here for project management should hopefully improve the luck or the success of your projects. It just remains for me to thank you for your time. I hope you've enjoyed today's briefing. I look forward to joining you soon for the next one. And I'd just like to finish by saying good luck and good marketing.